Hi, everyone. Welcome to our fifth Author Happy Hour, brought to you by the Kentucky Book Festival, a program of Kentucky Humanities. I'm Sarah Woods, the director of the Kentucky Book Festival, and I'm so glad you've joined us this evening. We'll continue with Author Happy Hours every Thursday at 7 p.m. till the end of October. You can join us on Facebook Live each week or register in advance on kyhumanities.org. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at KY Humanities for updates and announcements about the virtual Kentucky Book Festival. We'll continue in November, starting on November 9th with a, a special event with John Grisham, and we'll continue on through November 14th. You can find all that info on our website at kyhumanities.org. Um, grab your beverage of choice for our author happy hour. I'm boring, I've got water tonight, with four authors. Um, and get ready to learn about writing for tweens and teens. If you have any questions as we move along this evening, you can type those in the Q&A box and we'll do a Q&A at the end of the program. Um, I'll introduce our authors really fast before turning it over to our moderator. Author Mariama J. Lockington is an adoptee author and nonprofit educator. Her debut middle grade novel is For Black Girls Like Me and her second book is forthcoming in 2021. Welcome Mariama. Greg Howard was born and raised in South Carolina where his love of words and stories blossomed at a young age. Greg writes young adult and middle grade novels focusing on LGBTQ characters and issues. His most recent book is Middle School's a Drag, You Better Work. Hi, Greg. Ismay Williams is a pediatric cardiologist by day and an author by night. Her first book, Water in May, was published in 2017 and her most recent title is This Train is Being Held. Jason Lady grew up on military bases from Germany to Fort Knox. His first book, Monster Problems, was published in 2019, and his next book is forthcoming in December. And our moderator, Molly McCaffrey, is the Pushcart Prize-nominated author of two titles of nonfiction. Since earning her PhD, her work has appeared in numerous publications. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Molly. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Sarah. It's so great to see you. It's great to see you all. Um, welcome everyone. Um, happy hour. I think we should start with a toast. Cheers to everyone. Cheers. I know some of us are drinking water, which is fine. And I have grapefruit oh, prosecco. Cheers. So we're so happy you're here and we get to talk about teens and tweens for a whole hour. How fun. Welcome Ismay, Mariama, Greg, and Jason. So happy to have you here. The first thing I want to know is you know, how are you coping as a writer during the pandemic? Are you writing? Are you blocked? Who wants to jump in? I'll, I'll jump in. I'll say it's really, it's really hard. It's been really difficult. I thought initially, right, so my, my book came out February 11th, so I got to have a lunch, but then by March 13th, and I'm, I'm in New York City, we were gone. We were, it was just like school was shut down. We were in lockdown. And at first I thought, oh man, I'm gonna have all this time. I'm not traveling. I don't have to, you know, I just have to see my patients and then I can write. Mm -mm. I, I, I was just so distracted mm. by, you know, the computer is in my lap. So I'm constantly like looking at the numbers, checking on emails, checking on friends where people are, how are you doing? It's been a, it's been a huge distraction for me. Not, and I'm not gonna even mention having three kids home mm. all the time. Wow. Yeah, I agree with uh, Ismay. I also, my pub date was February 11th, Ismay, and oh. got, to have, got to have a launch, um, but then everything in March was canceled, all the festivals, and it was very defeating, you know, I mean, it felt very like a, like a huge setback, so I, like you, I thought, <laughs> well, I could write, I could write, I could write, um, uh, but it was hard to get in that groove again of writing. Um, I eventually did, and I'm working on, like, a couple different ideas right now waiting on edits on a new book but yeah it was it was really hard to get in that creative space oh i will agree i i mean i um was halfway through my debut year when the pandemic hit so um that has been um, a little bit challenging uh, but i have actually found them more so than writing because i'm on a couple of big deadlines for upcoming projects i've kind of had to force myself um to to tune things out sometimes and try to get something on the page or at least try to do something in service of the writing but i've had a really hard time reading this year um, and i'm usually books are usually something that i turn to to you know escape to immerse myself and 
Um, for a while, I was only able to listen to audiobooks, and just now I'm starting to be able to like focus at night or in the morning if I'm trying to read on any type of book, but it was really hard to read at the beginning of all of this. Wow, yeah. How about you, Jason? Yeah, I agree. I'm in the same boat as a lot of you. Um, you know, like you heard earlier, my first book came out just this past December. So I had a good two and a half months there to do some book signings at some of my local bookstores. They went really well. Um, I was having a blast meeting readers, meeting kids, meeting parents. And then, you know, all this happened. And uh, like all of you, all these events got canceled that I was really looking forward to. Uh, yeah. So that's been kind of a downer. It's been a bummer. And um, to get into a creative space has been very challenging. Um, I'm trying to write my third book. Um, I keep trying to get the right premise, you know, together before I start. And I'm on attempt number five <laughs> at this point. I'll get there at some point. But uh, yeah, it's very challenging time for sure. Wow. I'm thrilled to hear that you all had your books come out before the pandemic actually started, because I really feel for those people who had a book come out during the pandemic. Um, and so Jason and Mariama, this is your first published book. And then Ismay, it's your second. Greg, what number is this for you? Uh, four. Wow, that's great. Good for you. Are you with the same publisher the whole time, Greg? No, but the last two have been with Penguin. Okay, great. So my next question, we might as well start with Greg because he's talking is, why don't you tell us about your book, Middle School's a Drag? Great, thank you for holding it up. <laughs> uh, Middle School's a Drag, You Better Work is my second middle grade book after The Whispers, which came out last year. And it is about a 12-year-old uh, uh, gay boy who hasn't come out to everyone yet, but he's come out to his family and friends. And he's an entrepreneur, he's a kid entrepreneur, so he wants to start, his new big business idea is to start a junior talent agency. And his first client is a 13-year-old drag queen. Um, so wait, wait, you have to say the drag queen's name because it is so awesome. Okay. The stage name is Coco Caliente, Mistress of Madness and Mayhem. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> AKA Julian Vas Vasquez. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so let's go to Mariama. Why don't you tell us your I'll Hold Your Book Up too for Black Girls Like Me. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so for Black Girls Like Me is the story of 11 year old uh, girl named Makeda. And Makeda is the only black person in her family because she was adopted when she was a baby. Um, and the story starts in the middle of her sixth grade year when her parents who are musicians, her dad gets a new job. And so she has to move across the country with her mom and her dad and her big sister and leave behind sort of the only life she knows and a best friend. Um, and while she's in New Mexico, she's dealing with things that lots of kids deal with when they're the new kid, going to, going to a new school, trying to figure out who her friends are. But she's also starting to have big questions about um, how she fits into her family and also maybe the family that she came from um, in the beginning. And so it's a story about friendship, family, um, about finding your voice. Um, and it's based on some of my own personal experiences. It's still fiction, but um, it's an own voiceless story. So it came out in July of 2019. And you're an adoptee, right? Yes, and I'm an adoptee. Uh, me too. So I really related to this character, especially because I also moved my freshman year of high school across the country. So yes, we'll talk I later. a lot. So <laughs> okay, how about you, Jason? Monster problems. Sure, I have my own copy with me too. Great. <laughs> just just in case you didn't. Uh, Monster problems is about a sixth grader who loves to draw. He's based on me when I was a kid. I was always drawing and doodling and drawing my own comic strips. So he's very much drawn from uh, me and my experience, but he likes to draw a little too much and he gets in trouble for drawing in class and not paying attention. So he uh, gets in trouble. His parents ground him from drawing, which this did happen to me growing up and I deserved it. I completely own <laughs> what happened. No, I, when I read that, I thought how cruel, who could be grounded <laughs> from drawing? It did the trick though. I never uh, <laughs> misbehaved much again after that. But he's grounded from drawing and his bratty little brother who happens to be an academic genius and is good in every subject, whereas the main character, he feels like he's only good at drawing. He struggles in every other subject. So his little brother rubs it in on him, uh, really makes fun of him for it. So he's in his room alone with no drawing materials, feeling very bitter. And a mysterious bird comes to his windowsill and leaves him a special pen. He doesn't know it's special yet, but he uses it to draw a monster he envisions going after his brother and getting him. Well, everything he draws with this pen becomes real. It's a magic pen. And so he and his brother have to figure out what to do about the monster problem because this monster is now there uh, doing what it's supposed to do, going after his little brother, and they're the only ones that can see it. 
uh, as well to further complicate things. So it's kind of a fun, uh, zany adventure, but also with uh, some lessons in it about uh, using your gifts responsibly. Um, and uh, yeah, that's what it's about. Great, it is a lot of fun. All right, Ismay, why don't you tell us about your second book, This Train is Being Held? Thank you. So first of all, I have to say, I have to get the book, be your book, Jason, because that sounds like my oldest daughter, actually, like mm -hmm. to a T. Oh, but we cool. never grounded her from, from drawing, but we have scolded her for like doodling all over her school notebook, right? So it's like, how can you read your notes if you have doodles ever? So we only do it as a last issue. resort. Yeah, it's a last resort yeah. kind of thing. No, we, we, wouldn't, we <laughs> wouldn't take that away. But so uh, This Train is Being Held is a young adult novel. It has been likened to um, a retelling of West Side Story where both characters are Latinx. So I didn't write it with that intention, but I can totally see it and I'm going with it. because I think that's a great pitch because it, it is actually, it's a really good um, comp title for Romeo and Juliet for any educators who are looking for more contemporary comps for their students to read alongside the classics. So it's about, um, uh, I'll start with Alex is a Dominican American and he is a baseball prodigy and he lives in um, a neighborhood called Washington Heights in Manhattan and his poppy really wants him to go professional but Alex maybe wants to be a poet not that he could ever share that with his poppy mm -hmm. his poppy would never allow it and he wouldn't understand and then Isa is an Upper East Side private school girl who wants more than anything to become a professional ballerina, except her Havana-born mother thinks that is an unacceptable career choice for a modern woman. And um, also I throw a lot of other bad things that happen to poor Issa. Um, but so these, it's about, it's a, a subway, New York City subway romance. So these are two teens who are very high achieving. They both are Latinx, but from very different worlds. And they would otherwise not have met except for that subway that they're always taking to get to their after school activities. So that is it, but it, it does have some, so it is a romance. So it does have a, you know, a romantic ending as opposed to it's not a tragedy, but um, it does deal with issues of mental illness, colorism, classism, police brutality, and some other heavier topics that are pretty relevant, I think, to modern day teens. And it has the mental illness theme in common with Mariama's book, which also handles that very well, too. Yeah. It's made, since this is about tweens and teens, and then I'm going to ask the other three, would you ever write for tweens? Would you ever write middle grade? You know, I might. It's, it's funny. I feel like I, I went to very early in my career. So I didn't decide I wanted to be a writer until I was 37 and I was on bed rest with my third baby. And like all of a sudden I couldn't do all my doctoring stuff. And so I picked up a novel for the first time in 11 years and it just like blew my socks off. And I thought, this is, this is like a superpower. These authors who can write something to make the reader feel like intense emotion, that's a superpower. I wanna see if I can develop that superpower. So I remember I went to some writers conferences and I went to an SUBWI conference, which is for mm -hmm. um, Society of Children's book writers and illustrators. And the, one of the keynotes was this woman who, I can't remember her name, of course, but she was like a very well beloved picture book author and she was saying that people tend to write if you're a kid lit author you tend to write at the age that you feel yourself and so she was saying like i'm always a four-year-old or a five-year-old i'm always the person who runs up to you at the cocktail party and like gets like this close and is like what are you drinking or like what is that or what's why is your hair like that you know and it was so funny and i was like yes that's true and i feel like i am eternally like a 15 16 year old girl so i could probably try to do a tween. Um, I feel more comfortable in the teen space, at least now. Although th that might change because my kids are entering that teen space. So maybe I need to get out of it soon and go, <laughs> go younger. So I'm not, I'm not writing where they are, but we'll see. You might be inspired by them. Yeah. Well, so that kind of, I'm glad you answered the, another question I had for you. So the other three of you, I have two questions since Is may answer both of them. Both of them. First of all, would you ever write teens, young adult, for teens, young adult? And second question, um, why is it that you wanted to write for tweens? Why did you want to write middle grade? Let's start with um, Greg this time. 
You know, I my first novel with a with a traditional publisher with Simon Schuster was a YA book, a book for teens called Social Intercourse. Very kind of funny, raunchy. Um, didn't know what the he heck I was doing, kind of thing. <laughs> you know, but uh, they liked it. But I had a story I wanted to tell about my mother with the whispers um, from when I was that tween age, you know, I was actually on the younger side. So I wrote this story from the perspective of a, an 11 year old boy, uh, because that's what I remember being um, the story around my mother and what happened to her. Uh, I just kind of put myself into that voice. My agent was actually a little leery of me going from the social intercourse voice you know to middle grade but i just really enjoyed being in that headspace um and while the whispers was a very personal story and it was kind of easy to get into that because it was basically from my perspective when i was that age when it came time to write middle school's a drag you know um this was a completely made up story it had nothing to do with my life um but I so enjoyed being in that middle grade voice. And I, whereas I thought that the teen voice was my thing, uh, I kind of learned that no, middle grade is, is kind of the voice I feel the most comfortable with. And that's kind of where I'm staying. Plus, there's not as many uh, stories with uh, main characters who are uh, queer, LGBTQ in the middle grade space. There's some, it's getting better. But there's a lot in YA. So I decided to, to kind of focus my energies on where the, the need was. Great, great. What about you, Mariama? So my, um, my other big passion besides being a writer and a storyteller is that um, I'm also an educator. And so um, I have worked uh, in the sort of youth development nonprofit space for 13 years and specifically um, worked for a couple years for an organization that only worked with middle schoolers. Um, and so I love the middle school age. I think it is a time of, um, of it's an awkward time. There's a lot going on, but I think that um, young people who are in middle school have sort of an unfiltered uh, way of presenting themselves and asking questions and being open and curious um, and willing to learn that I really appreciate. Um, and so, um, you know, I didn't actually stumble, even though I was an educator, I didn't stumble. I sort of, sort of stumbled into writing for young people. I'm a poet by training. Um, and I started out thinking I was going to publish a book of poetry for adults. Um, and But it turned out the book of poetry that I was trying to publish was a series of prose poems all about an 11 year old girl or with an 11 year old girl voice. Um, and so that sort of turned into uh, what is now for black girls like me. Um, and I think there's some truth to what Ismael is saying because I feel um, very much like this book was the book I kind of needed to read or find when I was in that 11, 12 year old space. And I sort of sometimes feel like um, I'm, I'm stuck in that space a little bit or, or that's a space I identify with. Um, but I will say I have my second middle grade is coming out, but I also have a YA coming out in 2022. Um, and so um, I'm excited to delve into a slightly older voice um, right. and, and write about you know, a character who's 16, 17. Mm. Now we know why you have all the verse in your book, all the poetry. Yes, yeah. yeah. Which was beautiful. It was, it really was. Okay, great. How about you, Jason? Well, when I was first uh, in the early 2000s, after I got out of college, uh, sitting down and saying, you know, I want to write, I want to write books, and this is something I want to do. And I wrote a couple of manuscripts that were geared towards adults, kind of adult science fiction fantasy. And they just weren't that good. I couldn't make them work well. And so I was kind of discouraged. And my wife suggested, you know, Jason, you know, you're kind of a middle school boy at heart. <laughs> you really are. The middle school boy lives very strongly in you. And she's right. And she said, maybe you want to write for that age group. And um, that's, and then she suggested, you know, maybe a book where a kid has a magic pen, everything he draws becomes real. So I took that and kind of linked it to my own experiences as a middle schooler and uh, took that and ran with it. And you know, I like writing for this age group uh, because I have a really kind of silly sense of humor. I love to infuse humor into my story. And that age group still really appreciates silliness and absurdity. They really do. They love it. But at the same time, they're old enough where they can also get into the character development. They can get into a plot that's more sophisticated. And I like character development. I love plotting out stories. So to be able to write a story that's got some of those elements to it, but also the fun and the humor, it's the right age group. It's kind of the sweet spot uh, for uh, you know, all the elements that I want to write. Great, great. So I'm going to ask you all individual questions about your book, just for one round. 
we'll start with you, Ismay. Um, I wanted to ask you that I about the secret I heard that this train is being held is based on your grandparents, who I noticed the book is dedicated to. Oh. But then also, I asked for reader questions on my Facebook page, and someone said, have you ever had a secret love? So that kind of feeds into this question. Yeah, so that's that was a good pickup. I do have, I did dedicate the book to my abuelos who were both in Cuba and they did come from opposite ends of the island, but that was more of a reference to their very extreme class differences. Mm -hmm. So my grandfather was part of a family that had been in Cuba for since like it was colonized and they had tons of money and, and my grandmother's family had just come over. She was the first one born there and they had nothing. And she had to drop out of school to, um, when her, when her father passed away wow. to work and she thought she was going to be an old maid and then they met and you know, the rest is history. Um, but so it's not directly based on them because they were, they didn't grow up in New York, they grew up in Cuba, but it is, it is sort of that like class conflict. That, and that sort of, you know, how are, how are your families and your friends going to receive that if, you know, it's all of a sudden a couple that you wouldn't n normally see together, maybe, because they're, they're challenging some social norms. Um, so that is very much part of the book. Um, have I ever had a secret love? Well, um, you know, I will say that when my now husband and I started dating, which was a long time ago in college, we were friends first and we had, were part of like a very large group of friends and we kind of kept it secret for three months. So none of our other friends knew that we were sort of seeing each other. So that, that was actually super fun. I should write a book about that at some point. Mm -hmm. yeah. But that's, it's like, I don't know when I'm, when I say like, oh, and now we're married and he's like the father of my three kids, it's not as exciting as like saying like, oh yes, I have the secret love and he got away or whatever. <laughs> It should be a modern love column there. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, great, thank you. Um, oh, by the way, I forgot to say that question was from Amy in Minnesota. I promised people I'd mention it. Oh, nice. Yeah, question. So, Mariama, you're next. As I said, I'm an adoptee, so I love that this is an adoption story. I feel like there aren't enough in the world. And I'm just kind of wondering, what is it that you hope young readers will get from Makeda's adoption story? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I, so I, I, I mentioned that I wrote this book because there, first of all, there are not many stories out there at all, except for one that I know of that are uh, about adoption written by an adoptee. Um, for young people, I should say. There are lots of books um, not yeah. in the kid-lit space. But um, so I wanted to find a book when I was growing up and I was dealing with a lot of nuanced, complex feelings about my own adoption and my relationship to white family. Um, I wanted a book that validated some of those conflicting things, some of the loyalty that I was feeling to my adopted family, and then some of the grief and pain and wondering I was feeling about a family that I was separated from at birth. Um, and so really what I wanted to do with For Black Girls Like Me was write a story that in many ways is a universal story, is a story about a young person coming of age, um, a girl who is missing a best friend, a girl who is experiencing moving and being the new kid, who's dealing with bullying and racism, who's also um, dealing with a parent who lives with mental illness. Mm -hmm. um, but I also really wanted to validate the adoptee story and, and mess it up a little bit. Um, and so I like to tell young people that this is sort of about the messiness of growing up and also to validate the fact that it is possible to feel more than one thing at the same time and it doesn't mean that something is more important than the other thing. Um, and so I wish someone had told me that when I was growing up um, because sometimes I very much felt like I, I shouldn't be feeling this thing and felt a lot of shame about it mm -hmm. instead of understanding that no, we're, we're complex human beings. Um, we come to our families in a lot of different ways and um, sometimes life is joyful and sometimes it's not so joyful and those two things can live side by side. Um, and so I wanted to mess that up a little bit in the book. Um, and I also really wanted to talk um, honestly with young people about, um, you know, some things that happen in the world as far as racism and microaggressions and what happens when that feels like when you experience those things from people who love you because um, sometimes we hurt people we love unintentionally. Um, so those are some of the things that I hope young people will get out of it, but really just you can feel more than one thing at once and that, that is totally normal. Yeah, by the way, that argument between her, um, Makeda and her sister Eve at the end of the book was just, it blew me away. Like I felt both of what they were feeling, you know, it was excellent. Yeah. 
Okay, let's turn to Jason. So Jason, I noticed that like Mariama and Greg, you have this intense sibling relationship in your book. And that made me wonder, do you think that, and also you all have siblings who are either older or more mature and kind of, you know, depicted as smarter. And I wondered, do you think that's an important thing for a middle grade book, Jason, that this, that sibling relationships are always play a crucial role in those stories? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, for me and my sister growing up, it wasn't really uh, like that. I was kind of drawing on other things to bring that in. My sister is five years older than me, actually. And in my book, the main character, it's actually a younger brother. Um, so, you know, my sister and I were never really in the same school building even. So we got along pretty well because we were never in each other's stuff. You know, we were never, uh, you know, with the same friends, with the same crowd of people or anything like that. So we got along pretty well. Um, so, but as far as like the situation, I, I would say so, because you're, you're coming out of, you know, grade school, you're coming out of being a, a smaller child and uh, becoming older, getting more responsibility, you're pushing the envelope, you know, you want to do more, you want to have the things that older kids have. And if you have an older sibling, they're getting those things before you are, and you're watching them and saying, I want to be able to do that too. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're the older one, you've got the younger one kind of right there saying, hey, you know, can I do this too? Or can I tag along with you or whatever, uh, and so forth. So I think that, um, you know, as you're moving that stage of life where, you know, you are trying to figure out who you are, Plus, you have this other kid in the house, <laughs> you know, older or younger, that is kind of uh, getting in your way to some extent. You're trying to figure out the relationship, you know, in a way that you haven't before. So I think for the middle grade uh, writing space, yeah, I think siblings are going to figure into it a lot because they really figure it into life and, in, you know, in the real world. Yeah, at that time, for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Greg, your last... Um, Wow, the thing about Greg's book is those characters kind of just come screaming onto the page. They're all so fully drawn. They have these amazing diverse voices and I kind of fall in love with all of those characters. Whereas like Jason, I'm not gonna lie, kind of hated um, the brother character, you know, from the start, but I love- You're kind of supposed to. You're yeah. supposed to Jason, <laughs> right. You're supposed to, I'm not, it's not a criticism. But um, Greg, I was wondering then, so, I'm guessing that you started this book with the hook, because it's a great hook, and the plot, but it feels, it reads like you started with characters. What'd you start with? I always start with characters, uh. always, yeah. And the book, uh, the story kind of comes from, again, my life, like I do so often, mm -hmm. because when I was that age, I was a kid entrepreneur. I had the the storage closet office with my dad's old desk and I, I started a business called Anything Inc. And so all that is, you know, that was a good starting point, but it always has to start with me with a character. And what I like to do is find a, an interesting character and put them in a position, put them in a situation at the beginning of the book and see what happens. And then draw the other characters around them. Uh, thank God for great editors, you know, uh, Lila, uh, Mikey's younger sister, my book uh, at the beginning was just there for comic relief, you know, his arch nemesis. She has ended up being the one that I get the most letters about, about the favorite character is Lila. But it was my editor who helped me to draw her, her more fully and not just a one dimensional evil little sister, you know. But yeah, I... I always have a story to, to, to kind of go with, but to me, it's a book is only as strong as its characters and not only its main characters, but all the surrounding characters. So from Mikey's best friends, uh, Trey and Dinesh, to uh, Coco, who is Julian Vasquez and his family, to Lila, who is the evil little sister, to his other clients, um, I feel like there have to be full stories there uh, for kids to stay invested in the story you're trying to tell. Yeah, for sure. Great. Okay, so I have another question for all of you. Um, and this comes from, uh, let's see, Virginia from Glasgow, Kentucky, which is not that far from where I am. She wants to know, um, why do you all think diversity and inclusion is important in young adult and middle grade literature? Ooh, can what? I take this one first? Yeah, go for it, Greg. For me, and I, I know Mariam is probably going to say something similar, but when I was the age of my characters, I didn't have books like this. Mm. You know, I, when I was 10, 11, 12, 
there was nothing. And now I'm quite a bit older than most of the panelists, uh, but uh, there was nothing really. I know, I'm challenging this, Isma, are you? 54, yeah. 54. <laughs> oh, you look really young. Thanks. Uh, but you know, in in the in the seventies, there was not a lot of representation that kids could find in in the library, and so I want to write books that I wish I had had when I was that age. You know, so that's kind of my motivation. So that's why I think representation representation matters so much. Um, the letters I get the most from young readers are from kids who say. I've never seen myself in a book like this, you know? And again, in YA, there's a lot of it. In middle grade, not so much. Um, so that that's why I want to do this and, and keep middle grade progressing with representation. Yeah, and I noticed also how current it was that I think when I was young, because I'm close to your age, um, there was no 12 year old who was coming out to his friends or parents. So oh, I yeah. love that you said it today and he was doing that, you know? Yeah, because what I, and the, I'm glad you brought that up, Molly, because I talk to middle school kids all the time. I have uh, friends whose children are, are, are close to me and they're that age. And they tell me, especially in the South, it's still hard. You know, I mean, we, we want to think it's 2020 and it's so easy now for a 12 year old kid to come out. But it's, it's not always and not in the South and not in public schools. Um, my my friends who are that age tell me, yeah, it's easier in private schools. It's not so much in hmm. public schools, you know. So that's things to think about that these, it's not just all rosy and, <laughs> you know, everything for these kids. They still struggle. I, a one uh, youth uh, reached out to me who, he's actually 16. He just came out. He has supportive family, supportive friends, everything, you know, to support him. And it was still hard for him because society tells us it has to be one way and that's ingrained in us from the time we're born. For sure, right. Who else wants to jump in on this one? I'll just piggyback off of that. I mean, um, I think similarly, when I was growing up, I was looking for covers with black characters on, the, on them. I was looking for stories about multiracial families, mixed families, did not find a lot of those books. Started reading Toni Morrison very early because mm. she wrote unapologetically about black people and black life. And I saw myself um, even not having a lot in common with some of those characters. I saw sort of wow. um, my desires and things represented in some of those books. And so um, that's a big motivation and I'll agree some of the most rewarding uh, parts of being an author is when I get a letter or I see a young person when when I was able to <laughs> interact with young people out in person mm -hmm. and they say you know this was the first book that a I really liked reading um and I read all by myself and the first book where I saw myself represented in some way and that's that's just a really wonderful moment to be able to share with someone um, sure. but I will also just say that it's important because books and and reading teach us empathy I think and I think mm -hmm. um the more diverse stories, the more voices that you have um, on your bookshelves in classrooms and libraries um, where, you know, not just kids who maybe identify with who's on the cover, but kids who maybe have never read a book about someone that doesn't look like them or doesn't have the same religion as them. Um, it's important for getting a bigger and broader worldview. And so um, I think I'm a big advocate for, you know, the We Need Diverse Books movements. I love the Project Lit community, um, which is sort of updating book lists with more contemporary options or pairing them with some of the, you know, the, the canon that's still on book lists. And I think it's really important for young people to be able to sort of pick out um, various stories and engage with various stories. Yeah, yeah. And now you're making me so glad that we have Makeda and we don't have to have young black kids just reading Milkman. I mean, can you imagine? That's, that's from Toni Morrison, you know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I was reading about Pecola Breedlove from Blue Is High, uh, which is a beautiful story, but a devastating it's so dark. And I saw myself in little pieces of her story and how she yearned, you know, to sort of compare yeah. herself to uh, white ideals of beauty. And so, um, you know, like I said, I read it a little too young. I had to go back yes. to always go back to Toni Morrison and learn more and more. But um, yeah. we need uh, stories for young people um, that reflect um, their lives. For sure. Um, Jason, Ismay, do you want to jump in? I'll just bring up the analogy for those who haven't heard of the uh, Rudine Sims Bishop's really perfect explanation of books as windows, mirrors, and doors. I mean, we live in a global society. So again, it's 
you want the book to be a mirror so that a child can see themselves portrayed on the page and then they can see themselves accomplishing all of these great feats, going on the adventures, slaying the dragon, becoming the astronaut, flying to the moon. They need to see that. They wanna feel that they can be inspired and do all of those things. Um, but the book is also a window. So for people who might not look at the cover and say, oh, I'm that person on the cover, they can read about the character and they see the book provides them a window into a, a life that might be different from theirs, especially if they live in, a, in an area where um, there isn't a lot of diversity. This is important. But then the whole idea of the door is that you, you walk through and this gets back to sort of the reason that I started writing, like you become the character. So one of my favorite things is when you, you read a book and you think initially, you know, this character has nothing in common with me. Like, actually, I, I say this, you know, Issa has a lot more in common with me because her mother's Cuban and she doesn't always look Latina. And, you know, Alex has much less in common with me, but I, for, some, for whatever reason, I feel like I connected more with this character. Mm -hmm. And so I love that when you get surprised and, and that's sort of the human experience, right? That's what bonds us all together. And you realize, you know, it doesn't matter where you're from or what you look like or who you love. Are all people and we should be able to connect on the you know on that level on that sort of the sharing of emotion and sharing of experiences and so that's also very very beautiful but you know it's 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 really it's really important it's important to think of all the different types of, of diversity not just um, you know race gender sexuality um, culture but also you know ability level like I'm, I'm very excited when I read books about kids with ADD or kids who have cerebral palsy um, you know, and actually it's, it's interesting. My first book, Water in May was written, um, was more heavily based off of my experience as a pediatric cardiologist. And so it, it, the main character is a, a young girl who really wants to have a baby. So someone in her family will love her. And then she finds out the baby has a very severe heart problem. But a lot, I got a lot of feedback from people saying, you know, thank you so much for this book because I've never read a book, like a fiction book about that had a character in it with a heart problem. Um, and that's changed. We've seen more come out. And so that, you know, that's, that's just, it's good. And again, it's, it's like, it's character building for the reader, right? Like you, you read about it, you learn, you empathize. Um, it's, it's all, it's all good. You just right. need more of it. <laughs> for sure. It, but that's a beautiful book. And what I loved is that it was a story of a 15 year old getting pregnant. I mean, we need more of those books because it does happen. Uh, Jason, do you yeah. want to jump in? Sure. You know, I think about the books I read in elementary school and middle school. And, you know, I think about the role they played in just like expanding my imagination. You know, I have a pretty vivid imagination and it was developed that way through reading things like the Chronicles of Narnia, you know, reading things like Marvel Comics, you know, when I was a kid. And, um, you know, when I look back on it, a lot of the books that were very popular when, when I was a kid, you know, they starred a lot of uh, white protagonists. And so I think it's wonderful that things are changing and they have been changing, they're continuing to change so that, you know, um, a lot of different people will be able to see themselves in those books because I think every kid deserves that opportunity to, you know, enter a new world, have their um, perceptions of the world uh, expanded where, wow, what if there really were, you know, aliens in outer space? What if there really was a magic pen that brought to life what you drew with it? But be able to do that uh, with characters who they can relate to, who they can see that, you know, hey, they're, they are like me in some way, whatever that is. Um, so I think it's a very important role so that, uh, you know, everybody gets an opportunity to just get their imagination just ignited by, you know, uh, by books. For sure. I feel like everyone in kid lit gets this and I hope that it starts to become more prevalent in adult lit. Um, I think it is. I hope so. Um, I feel like we might have time for one more question from me and then maybe Sarah will jump in with some more audience questions. I guess the number one question I have left that I really want to ask everyone is one I already wanted to ask and then Stacy from Atlanta, Georgia said she wanted to know how did you become a writer? I know it's a typical question, but it's so fun to hear writers' origin stories. Can you each tell us? Uh, we'll go back to Greg, because we haven't heard from you in a while. Um, yeah, when I was young, I always wrote stories. I wrote my first book when I was in third grade. Um, it was really just um, plagiarized from a television movie of the week. <laughs> But I did say- Wait, which television movie? I, it was, you, 
you're too young. It was called the the I'm last. Your age. Okay, it was called the Last Survivor, and my friend Michael Lee in third grade illustrated it, and we actually sent it to Dial Books because we had books in our um, library in school uh, in our school library from Dial Books, and we actually got a handwritten rejection letter that was very oh, encouraging. Oh. It said you know, please, we thank you for sending this. We hope you will reach out in the future. And Dial is a part of Penguin and now I'm part of Penguin. So that, that all kind of happened, Aww. you know, <laughs> in a good way. Um, yeah. But honestly, I kind of let that dream of writing go. I came to Nashville to be a songwriter. And then I got into music producing and that's what I've been doing for the past 25 years. Uh, it wasn't until I was getting close to 50 that I thought, this is a dream I've always had. I need, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. So I, I wrote my first book um, and it was published when I was 50 years old, uh, which was four years ago. And thank you. That the, the lesson here is it's never too late. I hope everybody out there hears me. If you have a dream, it is Don't give it up. too late, right, Ismay? It's never too oh, late. Yeah. So my, my, journey was a little longer to get there. Um, but once I did it, I just, I found my people, I found my agent, I found my publishers. Uh, it's been, it's been a wonderful experience. Did you say you started writing again four years ago? So you started writing the same year that your first book came out? No, 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 no. I started writing about uh, six years ago. My first book came out in, uh, when I was 54 years ago. Okay. That's still fast. <laughs> yeah, it was all pretty fast. Yeah. All right, let's go to Jason really quick. Can we finish this question, Sarah? Do we have time? Okay. Jason, what about you? What's your origin story quickly? Sure. So um, I was kind of like Greg. I was always a kid who was uh, making my own stories. I started out doing my own comic strips that I drew. Then I drew my own comic books. Um, I was a military brat. So everywhere I moved, I had my friends in the story as the different characters. And um, had a lot of fun with that growing up. And it was always something there that I just never let go. It, it was always something I was compelled to do. And I mired in creative writing in college. Uh, one of my dad's friends told me when I was in high school, you know, it's really hard to make a full-time living as a writer. You may want to have something else. So um, I've always had, you know, a full-time job on top of, uh, you know, trying to write. Um, and uh, my career has taken different twists and turns. I work in human resources right now. Um, but I've always wanted to write. And so in 2007 is when I, you know, you heard a little earlier about, uh, you know, how I wrote some things that didn't really work out. And so I um, took a stab at writing a middle grade book, which turned out to be Monster Problems. And SCBWI, uh, someone mentioned them earlier, they were a huge help in helping me refine it and kind of get it. And then um, I learned a lot about the, uh, the querying process, you know, as far as uh, trying to get published. And then I just kept at it over the years. So 13 years it took wow. to get published. And wow. I took breaks here and there because you have to. Um, I went to grad school for a while, didn't really have the time or the energy to do it um, at that point. But persistence is key. And I just want to echo what Greg said. If you have a goal, you have a dream, like, you know, this is proof. You've got to keep at it. I just never gave up. And then uh, finally, you know, got a, a publisher and a, a book contract after all that time. But what really was key was just not stopping believing in the work, believing that that story had an audience out there and um, that that story, uh, you know, could be meaningful to some kids out there if I could just get it out there. Um, and I just had to not stop. So I would say, uh, yeah, just be persistent and uh, don't give up. That's a great story. And I'm glad you mentioned SCBWI again. I met Ismay at the SCBWI New York conference. And I know Greg from SCBWI Mid-South and Mariama is going to join, I hope. Um, but I, we had another question we won't have time to get to, which is about what should, what should you do? And if you're listening and you want to be a writer for, or illustrator for kids or teens, you should join SBWI. But let's go to Mariama to answer that origin story question. And then we'll go to Ismay. Yeah, um, I was going to say it was, it's nice to hear Jason's story. It's funny, um, 
oftentimes people, when they find out how many different places I've lived in, I've lived in over 10 different states and a bunch more cities, they ask me if I'm a military brat, but actually I grew up in a family of musicians, of classical musicians. And so um, as my parents got new gigs um, in different places, we moved a lot around to different places. And so um, music, my family growing up, music was always really important. Uh, the arts were always really important. Um, I had to play two instruments growing up. Um, I no longer play them, but what I found um, through music was um, that it helped me when I came to writing to understand that uh, you have to practice at something, even when you're talented at it, you have to mm -hmm. practice it and hone it. And sometimes you fail and have to try again. And so, um, you know, I was a kid who loved stories. I would make my own books. I would write poems. Um, and then I went to college and I um, studied creative writing and um, literature. And then I also became part of the spoken word slam poetry scene um, in my college years at University of Michigan. Um, and that really helped me find a community of writers, which I think is also really important as other people to bounce your ideas off of um, and to give you honest critiques so that you can come become better. Um, and then I went on to grad school and I got my MFA in poetry. Like I said, I was you know set on writing books of poems for adults, I thought, and I might still do that one day too, but um, I ended up publishing an essay about my own experience as an adoptee um, in BuzzFeed in, I think, 2015, um, and it got a lot more attention than I thought it was going to get, um, and from that sort of attention, I um, got contacted by an editor, my now editor, um, about writing for, for young people, about some of my experiences um, and that's sort of how I, I got into the publishing world, at least, um, and I'm happy I'm here. But um, yeah, I think it's just, storytelling has always been part of me. It's always been something I know I wanted to do and sort of teach and be in the classroom in some capacity and also tell stories. That's great. I'm gonna look up that BuzzFeed article now. Yes, it's out there. <laughs> great. How about you, Esme? So I kind of answered a little bit before, but I'll, I'll, I'll embellish a little bit more, which is that I, I got the writing, I got bitten by the writing bug in 2010, and I spent three months writing a draft, and then I spent the next four years learning how to write, mm -hmm. you know, going to these conferences, learning the mechanics, also learning what is a query letter, wait, what's an agent do, um, and then I kept trying to shop that same manuscript, and people kept telling me, most authors don't get, you know, don't get published, you know, don't end up pub being published with their first you can try another project, but I was so invested in that very first one. It was very difficult for me to put it aside. But then when I did, I wrote this also really quickly in three months and then like, poof, got the agent, got the editor. And then, yeah, but that was five years after I started. So again, with the whole, don't give up. If you have, if you have the passion in you, follow it, persevere. For sure. That's a great transition back to Sarah, who should keep writing too. <laughs> yeah, me and me and Molly go way back. Molly's written what? Two books? Three books? Well, written and published are two different things. I think I've written <laughs> six or seven and published two, yeah. Well, um, one of these days I'll I'll have one. We'll see. Yes. Um, so I have a few questions. Um, here's one from Lee. She says, it's probably for Greg because she's she's also from South Carolina. Shout out South Carolina. She said, I finished my first draft of a middle school novel with an intersex non-binary protagonist. Um, she said, I am neither. Advice for writing this character with integrity and respect. Um, research and talking to people who who are those things, who are intersex and non-binary. I just uh, finished today, Felix Ever After by Casey Callender. And I don't feel like I could have written that novel about a black trans boy who um, kind of is still questioning their gender. But uh, if you do your research, if you talk to the right people, if you get uh, sensitivity readers, it's possible, but I would, caution to be very careful um, because you, you don't want to get that wrong um, but don't don't feel um, uh, I'm not saying that certain people shouldn't write certain things I'm not saying that I, I, I think if you do your research and you do it well and you write it well um, that's acceptable but be sure you put the work in be sure you get the sensitivity readers mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think Anne Lamott in her book, Bird by Bird, talked a lot about how she researched for her books. And it was a yes. lot of phone calls, library visits. Exactly. Yeah. Don't assume you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. Here's a question for everyone. How do you keep yourself writing authentically, given that you are no longer a teen or tween and you're writing for teens and tweens? I think something that's helpful is uh, being around uh, kids that age. Um, I don't have kids, but a lot of my friends do. And I have nieces and nephews, so kind of staying in communication with them, hanging out with them, listening to them, uh, having relationships with them. You know, I'm either an uncle or an unofficial uncle to a lot of kids. And um, I can get a lot out of just talking to them. And then I think, too, you know, I alluded to it earlier, there's something about keeping in touch with your inner child, like however you make that work for yourself, uh, you do that. And don't let the things in your childhood be so far back in the midst of time that you don't remember what it was like, because regardless of what generation you're in, there are some things that are just universal that all kids are dealing with, regardless of when they grew up. And so just staying in touch with those memories and being able to bring them to the fore uh, when you write your stories, I think is, uh, is very important. I would agree. Um, you know, when I was writing for Black Girls Like Me, I was um, coaching a group of girls for a program called Girls on the Run. Um, and so we would run around the school and I would, you know, check in with everybody and just overhear conversations and dialogue and um, build relationships with them and be around them and listening to how young people were interacting with one another. Um, but another thing that I think is really important is uh, trusting young people to be your beta readers, um, giving, you know, rough drafts or almost complete drafts of your books to um, maybe some young people in your life that um, you trust and telling them, you know, I want your feedback. If something here sounds like it wouldn't be said from a young person your age, let me know and, and bringing them into that process too and letting them be the experts because they are the experts. I'm glad you said that because we, we did have another question. Um, actually, someone asked if you guys gave your books out to younger, um, to beta readers that were the age of the main characters in your books. So um, that's good to know. That's a, that's a great idea. I didn't know that, um, I guess I didn't know that authors did that, but it makes sense, especially if you're writing for a certain age group, right? So um, let's see. How do you make mindful choices about representation when choosing and developing characters? This was a learning process for me, honestly, this question, starting back from my YA book, Social Intercourse, uh, I had to learn that process. I had to learn, as, you know, as a white guy um, and cisgender, I am gay, but I'm still very privileged um, uh, in comparison to marginal, some marginalized people. But um, publishing can sometimes not give you the greatest advice. And when I say publishing, I mean, you know, the powers that be. It's like, put more diverse characters in there. Um, you shouldn't be writing those characters, you know? It's a little bit of a back and forth. Um, so, so I have just, I have found to trust my editor um, and I, I want to be as inclusive as I can, but I don't personally want to write from the perspective of someone who I don't know their experience. That's a good answer. Can I just add something? Oh, yeah. There's, um, there's a essay and by an author named Alexander Chi that, that talks about like, you know, if you want to write a character that's not from your background or a marginalized character, question to ask yourself first. And the three questions I think I might be paraphrasing are like, why do you want to write this story? And being really um, honest with yourself about why you want to write this story. Do you know anyone from this background or this perspective in your life? Like, are you friends? Are you part of this community? Are you close to this community? Um, and then is there someone else that could better tell this story? Um, and so I think whether you're approaching main characters or you're approaching side characters, um, it's important to think through those three questions when you're coming to the page, uh, because sometimes maybe the answer to that question is, I don't need to write this story, or if I'm going to write this character, I really need to make sure that I do my research or I'm engaging with, with this community. And even still, you know, if I give them a, a draft of something and I get feedback, I might not be the person to write this. So I think asking yourself those three questions can also help with that integrity as far as making sure you're the right one to be telling the story. Yeah. 
And, and I would add on to that, Natalie Perkins has written beautifully about the issue of, um, of power, right? And so it's, you have to realize whether your characters are at the same level of power in society that you are in and how that affects your perception. So it's even if you might share the same race or culture or gender or sexuality as your character, if your character is, you know, has other disadvantages that you don't have, you should be aware of those and be very careful that, you know, your privilege doesn't blind you. Mm -hmm. Well, do you all have any um, recommendations for readers, any books that you've been reading lately that uh, you just oh. want to share about? Yes, I just started reading one recently. I actually, I read a, an adult nonfiction book, The Warmth of Other Suns, which was really excellent. Um, and now I am reading, let me see if I can get to the cover of this. Um, oh gosh, no, no, you can't see it. All the Wind in the World. Let me see if I can go to cover. Cover. Oh yeah. Yeah. By Samantha Mabry. And I am, I'm enthralled. Um, I agree. Um, you know, it was, it was hard for me to sort of connect with some books earlier on in the pandemic because I was very distracted or sort of like just get into the characters and just be completely swept away. But this, this one is, is doing a pretty good job. So I would recommend it. I'd like to encourage readers to read outside their comfort zone, which is something I have challenged myself to do this year. Um, I loved For Black Girls Like Me by Mariama. It is something so so far beyond my experience, but it was so beautiful. It was so uh, wonderful to learn from her experience. Again, I just finished Felix Ever After by Casey Callender about a, a New York trans uh, demi boy, uh, black kid, and that is so far beyond my experience, but I feel richer for having read it. So I would just encourage you to read outside of your comfort zone. Anything? Can I come in and recommend, I'm sorry, Mariama, you go I ahead. I was just going to say anything by Case and Calendar, um, Hurricane Child, uh, not Hurricane Child, um, but King and the Dragonflies, which is up for a National Book Award, is a beautiful middle grade um, um, about a queer black boy. Um, and it was one of my favorite middle grades that I've read this year, too. So great. I'm going to recommend um, The Places We Sleep um, by Caroline Dubois. Um, this is like um, about a middle grade military kid. Um, on September 11th um, and her dad gets deployed and at the same time she has family in New York City um, and I won't tell you everything that happens but um, they're you know in the path of destruction essentially someone in the World Trade Center so that's a really beautiful book and it's written in verse Mariam. Love it. Well, thank you all so much. I think that we're almost up to eight o'clock. Um, Molly, thank you for asking such great questions. Thank you all for writing such wonderful books. I can't wait to see more of your work. I know most of you, Ismay, do you have another book coming out in 2021? Nope, not yet. <laughs> Okay, well, we'll, we'll wait eagerly, eagerly for it. Um, thank you all so much for being here and sharing about your work. Um, and we just wish you all the best. Wish we could have done this in person, but hopefully next year we can come together um, and celebrate books together. So thank you all so much for being here with us. Thank you. Thank you so much thank for you. having us. Thank you. It's great to be here. I had a lot of fun. Bye-bye. It's nice Bye. to meet you all. Thanks to our authors for being with us tonight and sharing about their books. You can find links to purchase their books on kyhumanities.org, or you can hop on over to josephbeth.com and find all their books there. They're our bookselling partner, and we're pleased to be working with them this year. Um, you can find info to register for all our upcoming events on kyhumanities.org. Remember, we'll be going on with events from November 9th through 14th, and we will include author happy hours till the end of October. Um, in those events. We hope you'll join us for those. If you've participated through Zoom, there will be a short survey when this um, event closes. It's five questions. We hope you'll answer those questions and give us feedback about this event. 
Stay up to date by signing up for our newsletter on kyhumanities.org and follow us at kyhumanities on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Next week on Thursday, October 22nd, we will be hosting another author happy hour with Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Nicholas D. Kristoff in conversation with Deidre Denny of Transylvania University. We hope you will join us. We'll see you next Thursday.